Expectations take way me down. My heart is begging me to get the hell out of my head. I wanna live inside the upside down. For a minute and pretend, honey, I'm a perfect ten. Whoa, whoa, honey, I'm a perfect ten. Whoa, whoa, and if I say.
It's a tug of war Battling to keep my sanity Say no more, say no more I love you but Expectations take weigh me down My heart is begging me to get the hell out of my head I wanna live inside the upside down For a minute and pretend Honey, I'm a perfect ten, whoa, whoa Honey, I'm a perfect ten, whoa, whoa And if I say it Hello, everybody, and welcome to the week seven of the Meta High School Sports League. We're kicking today off with Balkham Hills High School and Carringborough High School from New South Wales going head to head in our first game of today. My name is Ewan Eardus Reed. I am joined by Reinhardt, and we'll be kicking this one off with style. I'm loving this. The fact that you said style, just like <laughs> I was already thinking, like when you said break teams are from New South Wales, I was immediately thinking that we're gonna have a bit of rivalry between two two teams from their aren't like from the same town or from like you know the same territory, and it's gonna be nice to see who's gonna try and take the trophy and you know come out on top. I am like really keen to get into game number one from today. This is just absolutely amazing coming out, but. What is what are your opinions about like you know these two teams based in Champions League? Well, based on what we've got so far. Well, based on what we've got so far right now, Glenn, I'm already sort of leaning towards Carring Bar High School. We've seen them earlier in the tournament, and they did an amazing job of snowballing from lane. Unfortunately, they didn't really have much shot calling or much macro decision making to they fell apart in the mid game and unfortunately got outscaled. So my eyes are going to be on the side of Carring Bar High School. And my big question for them is, have you improved your shot calling? Can you organize your lane allocations properly and avoid the enemy team from scaling up once you have such a dominant early game? I agree. And this is something that I'm really looking forward into uh, coming out from both teams. I mean, coming into this new patch, we have some slight changes coming around where some champions have made 
uh, you know, they've been nerfed quite a bit. We've seen uh, some actually make a considerable difference. A noticeable champion that I've seen played quite often on the Rift, Jarvan 4. He has had a few nerfs, but I'm still seeing him played quite often in jungle. And it's really interesting to see that even though he's actually lost it, like a few extra touches, a few highlight features, he's still doing incredibly well. Indeed, he's doing an amazing job right now. And this is a meta right now in Season 9 where I've sort of seen it as players, it, the most impactful player in the game for the first 50 minutes is that jungle role. And what we need to be focusing on is how much impact does this jungle have? And specifically, what champion do they lock in? Jarvan, you talk about how he's super high priority. Part of the reason is he is so aggressive in the early game. That is so true. I mean, his entire kit, his flag and drag, and when he hits level 6, the Cataclysm is just absolutely like a CC control heaven for whoever decides to play him. And like something else I do need to highlight between, you know, coming into junglers in early game is that jungler presence is vital. I mean, if you have a champion that is not very strong with, you know, lane presence coming out, you might, you might want to make sure that, you know, every single lane has more secure champions uh, in slotted into each. And majority of the time, that's like early base champions. For example, we've got Rennington in top. You've got Ari in mid lane. And then bottom lane, you probably want to go for something like an Ash and Lux, mainly because of their poking potential, uh, the ability to like, you know, get control in a team fight if they decide to clash against their opponent right up front and really get that team a bit more of an opportunity to try and get ahead, you know, before getting into the mid game stage where we see items completed, uh, first turret going down, as well as objectives beginning to sort of highlight between, you know, what they want to focus on. Well, I'll have to find out what these teams do elect for, whether they're going to go for this super aggressive early style, which I would love to see. Or the other style I've been seeing lately where it's a very aggressive top side and then bottom lane is just sort of relegated to, oh, just sort of sit back, farm up and see where it takes you. But we'll have to find out as we are loaded into champion select right now and the first one being taken away is the Trickster Shaco. You know what, Eotos? It's actually interesting. This Well, I'm actually liking that we're seeing Shaco taken away. It's going to give... A character, it's going to give Vulcan High a bit more comfortability when being able to, you know, stay in lane for a bit longer if they do... If they do get a little bit pressured, if they do poke a little bit too hard, having that Shaco, you know, put away in bands is really going to give them a little bit more, uh, you know, security of mind, like a peace of mind that they're not going to get surprise ganked. Well, that is a, uh, well, that's kind of a Shaco specialty, and it does fit into the playstyle of aggressive junglers early. But what's interesting to me, while we are seeing a lot of variety bands, specifically AD carries coming out of Cariba, um, we are seeing a lack of junglers, honestly. Like, we're seeing no Jarvan, we're seeing no Kindred, we're seeing no Sejuani being banned away right now. So it's a little bit interesting to me that they're not electing to take away what I at least have been seeing as the super top tier junglers. But I suppose it might be up to team preference as uh, we are seeing the final bans coming up from Balkan Hill. So the Shaco is uh, a little surprising, but definitely that early game menace. But the Yasuo and the Alistair denied as well. I, I'm actually liking this. Like, we're seeing some more target-based ba target bands. Like, we're seeing at least two ADCs. Uh, and a Yasuo is definitely a highlight champion to take away. He's usually either picked or banned. Lee Sin is something very nice Five. to see. He is powerful early. And, yeah, I agree. We're seeing Hecarim <laughs> being picked for either Cannon or Smite. I am liking to see where this is going. Oh, but there's the Jarvan locked in as well. So we're seeing these top tier champions, but the one concern I have for Balkan Hills, while we do know that Hecarim is an extremely powerful champion now with the Conqueror up in top lane, Nautilus is the quote unquote counter right now because Hecarim relies on being super, super mobile and Nautilus, the king of crowd control, is a very easy way to stop him from moving. And what makes this more interesting is that we've got Tom Kenj being picked for Lance and possibly. And like as I was speaking earlier, or as I mentioned earlier before we got, on to, uh, got into this, Jabba 4 is still making ho like a horrendous amount of appearances on Summoner's Rift. And we're seeing him being picked for uh, Displeased. And I, feel, I believe as though we're going to see a lot of intent, a lot of ganking potential coming at him coming into the first 15 minutes of you know this game today. Oh, I'll have to find out what's another interesting thing is the Tom Kench lock in, and I love that because, hey, while Tom Kench did get a little bit of a nerf in this particular patch, the fact that you're locking Thresh into Tom Kench does raise a few questions for me because typically Tom Kench is the, the answer to Thresh. You hook somewhere and he's like, all right, gobble up, run away with them, all is good. So 
I find that a little bit interesting, but we'll have to see. They are pairing it up with a Jinx, however, and that does scream to a Tom Kench, because he's now got a hyper carry and a hell of a way to protect her. What makes this very interesting is that coming out from Carrick Bar, they've already locked away their potential bottom lane. So I feel so they're very confident in, you know, going up against whatever Vulcan have to offer. And they're going to try and focus more on their top and mid laners to try and steal away the game and work well in their favor. So my personal opinion and prediction for, you know, coming into this matchup, Carrying Bar are looking to get their jungler to try and focus more mid and top lane. And as I speak, we have another hyper, a mid game hyper scary, uh, scaling base champion, Vayne, locked away in the ban list. I am, it's interesting to see, like, she's still very strong until we see that Ginsu's Rage Blade nerf coming out, I believe. I've, I've heard it mentioned recently, it's going to be coming out in next patch. We're going to be seeing her either picked or banned away quite a lot. Oh, well, to see right now, banned is the answer for carrying by. So they don't want to deal with that in the bottom lane. So it makes a lot of sense. They want to make sure that they are the ones with the best scaling. And the Jinx definitely sells to that point. But let's see what lanes lock in right now. The Akali taken away is very a powerful champion. So I do like to see her being hit by the banless. And now carrying but four seconds left on their final ban. Aurelia's the selection. You know what, seeing a Relay banned is not very surprising. Like, she is another hyperscaling based champion. Once she gets that Trinity Force, the game completely turns and she comes online and surprises her enemy counterpart, whatever they tried to do. Before she gets that, they can take her on. But, you know, once she collects that item, once it's fully built and you see it in that infantry, the tides turn and the catch you can actually catch the enemy off guard. What I'm interested in seeing and a little bit worried uh, from Vulcan is that they've got Sion picked for top lane. So it looks like they might be going for a 4-1 split combo where he's just going to be like, you know, going for the, the side push, you know, through a majority of the game. Well, let's find out. He is going into another tank, that being the Orn. I am, I'll be honest, uh, I've said this many times on Cl Cast Glen. When I see a Sion, I think to myself, why don't you pick Kled? Kled is so good into the Sion, but it looks like Karen Burst said, well, we could take a Kled, but we need a stabilizing presence in the top lane. And more than anything, we need a beautiful way to start the fight. So that's why we're seeing the Orn locked in. But on the other side, Balkan looks like they're trying to grab themselves a mid laner and says, all right, let's play something very safe. We'll blind click the Vladimir. I'm interested in seeing... Coming out from coming out from Balkan, the ADC is yet to be picked. So K265 is pretty much going to be someone that they're going to try and protect coming into the mid game. Like we see him hovering around Val Varus. He does lock it in. So we've got the complete lineup coming out from Balkan. In response, we still have yet to see their mid laner. So I feel as though Midget on a Hill is really going to try and work well for his team. I mean, he's the last to be picked. And when you're the last to be picked for your team, it is most likely like the indication that you are going to try and be the playmaker for your team. You're going to try and be the one that's going to have that early game advantage, mainly because you have the opportunity to pick a champion that's going to go well against whatever they've decided to throw onto the table. Well, it looks like they are electing to grab themselves the rise for their mid laner. And I'll be honest, I got really, really excited at seeing the hovering of the Orianna. Orianna into Vladimir, in my opinion at least, is a very good matchup. But Lanson, who is going to be taking the rise, uh, does look like they're not actually in LCS order. Uh, he's been very confident with that matchup, saying, okay, it doesn't really matter what you bring, I'm certain that my Rise can handle it. Oh, we're seeing that this is actually not in uh, select nope. order from top to support. Well, that's a bit interesting. I was actually under the impression that, that was, that's how this was going to go out. But, you know, looking at this, looking from top to bottom, we've got Sion in top lane for Chicken. We've got Jungle for Hecarim coming out from Smites. Mid lane's going Vladimir uh, by K265. Cloud as the ADC and Cannon as the support. Volcom have got an interesting lineup. I like that they've got Vladimir. They've got Sion, who's a potential split push top side. You've got a very early game aggressive jungler that once he gets that Trinity Force, he's going to become, you know, the living helicopter. He's going to be the fire lap of <laughs> Summoner's Rift. And, you know, if he goes for that Conqueror, he's going to do well in prolonged trades. Whereas looking over at Caring Bar High, I like that we've got a bit of a a bit of a response like coming. We've got Jarvan Four to try and match Hecarim. He does have the early game advantage. Then you've got mid lane Lanson taking on Rise in response to a Vladimir. I feel as though he can do well. The only thing he has to watch out for is Vladimir's pull because he can stun Vladimir. Or sorry, he can snare Vladimir in place and try and un like you know unload his entire kit onto him. But if he tries to time himself well against K two six five. He'll be able to try and, you know, bait out that pool, wait for it to wait for the duration to end, go on cooldown, and then just completely unload everything effectively so that way he gets that 
you know, that unseen advantage that can be a little bit of a, a little bit of a surprise. And if you try and time yourself, well, it could really well in your favor. And, you know, playing as a Vladimir, you don't really have like, yes, you don't have a resource, but you do have health to worry about. And since his abilities do rely on his health or how much health he has, he does need to be a little bit more mindful of it. So that's, I guess that's one thing we probably want to look out for coming into uh, the matchup between two, two bottom lanes, bottom, Sorry, I re- I have to correct myself. Mid lane, but bottom lane, I like it. We've got we've got Thresh and Varus into Tom Kench and Jinx. As you said before, we've got a bit of a question coming out as Thresh is being picked into Tom Kench. Why do you say that? It's partly because whenever you throw out the death sentence, let's say you land onto the Jinx in this scenario, then Tom Kench is like, "All right, cool. I'm just using my W. I'm a runaway with Jinx. And if you decide to follow up, you're going to end up diving hella into my back line." Uh, and you compare that to, you, you hook the Tom Kench, well, there's no point hooking a Tom Kench. Like, that's not how you go fishing for catfish. So it's one of these scenarios where Vulcan, the Hecarim, the, sorry, the Thresh pretty much wants to target anyone when the Tom Kench is not around. Oh, that being said, thank you for the, thank you for the highlight. Thank you for the, and like, you know, the moment of enlightenment. I was a little bit confused when you actually said that to begin with. But now that we've got the, you know, we've got jungle, we've got mid, we have bottom, tucked away with our like you know a bit of explanation and uh prediction top lane is something to consider we've got two very strong uh i guess you could say split push based champions we've got scion versus Orn. a very interesting matchup i feel as though it could go either way like it i feel as though looking at these two champions it does come down to you know more of skill who can catch who out who can try and get the raw health right so who can try and damage the opponent through raw health indication instead of you know getting them when they actually pop their shields because they both have shields the only major difference i see between the two is that sion has a knock up that enables him to get in before orn be able to uh, get his shield up and does maximum health damage with that thunderclap that he has in his kit Whereas Orn does have the similar type of ability, but he needs to set up a little bit more because he's got that pillar he needs to knock down. He's got to charge into it and make sure Scion's within the range of his ability when he tries to get that knock up. If he does, nor Orn, I feel as though, will have the advantage when going for the initial trade because he'll get that raw damage out instead of accidentally getting Scion's shield, which is very problematic when you're going in for a trade. I mean, there's a fun little interaction with this Orn Scion that I noticed the other day I was uh, casting, and I saw you can actually interrupt the Decimating Smash, the Q of the Scion, with your Volcanic Rupture, because when that little point pops out, you can actually disrupt the Scion and cancel his Q. So, Ludens, my eye is going to be on you. Can you uh, disrupt the Scion, make his life a little bit annoying? But you are right on that top side. It's I think it might be a little more Scion favorable. What you have to respect is the fact that Orn does have more team impact. Not just the fact of the Call of the Forge card, but remember, he can upgrade the items. So when you get to this late game, if we get to the late game, you know, six item power spikes for everybody, you've got to acknowledge that carrying Baha'i will simply have more damage because we'll have the upgraded Infinity Edge. You'll probably have the upgraded uh, Black Cleave out of the Jarvan. So everyone's going to have a little more oomph, no matter, what, no matter even if they're on even items to the opposite numbers. That's interesting that you say that, but coming in at six items, that's usually that's usually around the 25 to 30 minute mark. I have seen quite often in Summoner's Rift when someone plays Orn is that they actually get their own two items upgraded first, and that's usually when they get to their three item power spike. I wonder if we're going to see something very similar coming out from Ludens in this matchup today. Well, there's only one way to find out, and that will be when we do get ourselves prepped up but what's another thing i do want to call attention to you mentioned it briefly before is the resource management that we will be seeing out of these two bottom laners uh, mid laners sorry because the health pool of the vladimir versus the mana pool of the rise but we'll be ready to get into the game very shortly i want to see what this matchup's going to be doing And I'm liking this. We have on the blue side, Bulkham Hills High School versus Caring Bar High School. They're both teams from New South Wales. And I'm very keen to see how this rivalry is going to play out. Because it's nice to verse, like as I said before, and I'll repeat again, it's nice to verse, you know, a team from your hometown or like, you know, within your same region. You know, it's like, a, it's like you know, you know, West Side Pride or something of the sort. Like the, like the highlight is very common. And... I like that we're seeing coming into this starter, we've got the Wall of Human Warding coming out from Caring Bar, whereas Balkum have decided to go for a five-man collapse. But it looks like 
no one's managed in the Kang first blood because there was a very huge amount of aggression coming out from Blue, whereas Karen, Karen Bar have decided to go a little bit more passive and try and get vision on what their opposition is trying to do. And it's really nice to see because you don't really want to give away first blood, but you also want to know where your enemy counterparts are. And, you know, coming into this at 1 minute 10, I'm very curious as to see, you know, who's going to try and take away this early game because whoever does, you know, make advantage in the first, I guess you could say five or so minutes, we're going to begin to see who's going to like take control of the lane and who's going to have more of map control based on how these teams are going to respond to the junglers when we get those, uh, you know, those uh, river, river scudders spawning at three minutes 15. I mean, I think that it should be on Balkam Hill to take the early game. You look at their composition, and it really does feel like a mid to early game style composition, you know? While you look at their Varus, he really gets aligned with those two items, the Blade of the Rune King and the Gwinsu's Rage Blade. The Vladimir doesn't really need to worry about as much scaling, especially when you compare it to Lights of Arise. So I really want Balkan to play aggressive in the early game, get themselves a lead, and build an early tempo. Because Karing Bar, look at the lineup. I see a Rise, I see a Jinx. And I think to myself, if they can get to 20, 30 minutes and they're ahead of their opposite numbers, they're late game champions as it is and they're already getting accelerated. I think that was a disastrous decision for Balkan to be in if the enemy hyper carries are able to get online earlier than intended. You know what? That's very true. And like, as we can see, looking over in top lane, Chicken is already forced on his own uh -oh. turret. He's very low. <laughs> M what is MFI doing over at that blue buff? He does get caught out. Emphis is trying to force a vertical jungling, actually. He's grabbed himself a buff and he's like, oh, I'm going to try to buff the enemy. I got this, but no such luck. And in a way, it's a little bit unfortunate that he wasn't able to do that. But he is calling reinforcements. Luden's deciding to come rotate down. And do the mid laners join? We'll have to find out. Oh, just as we're coming to find out, I like that. We've, so far, I feel as though Jarvan 4 does have the advantage because he still has a lot of mana left in his kit. Whereas, look at Smite. He's below half mana. Sion's low on health. He does have that little bit of feasibility now, but it looks like we're having uh -oh. three men collapse. Rise is coming in. This is a three man pie now. MS in the front line. He's taking a He's down with the first blood coming in. But it's a one for one trade. Chicken now trying to do what he can. Vladimir realizes, hey, wait a second. Where's my Rise go? Ah, oh, crap. I gotta get into the fight. The flash of the wall is not gonna save him. The Rise grabs himself a blue buff and a kill in the early game. A bit of an unfortunate uh, flash coming out from Chicken. I mean, he does manage to get over the wall, but it was a little, t it was a little bit too late when he did pop it. Looking at how this is going, it looks like three members from Caring Bar have already got two takedowns in their kit, and it's going to put them ahead a little bit. From what, looking at the scoreboard, they haven't really, like, put themselves in a bit of an upset situation. Like, they're still very close in CS accumulation, but now that they've got these takedowns also added to their scoreboard, it's going to look real favorable coming into the early portion. Cannon, I'm a little bit confused. Like, he's missing those death sentences. I wonder if this is going to work well for them, considering they are forced a little bit behind. We'll find out. Top side, there is another gank. MF's being as active as humanly possible. There is no flash on the Scion. Remember, the flag and drag, and that's going to be an easy pickup. There. Gank coming out of Emphasis Jarvan. This is that early game we were hoping. No way. Luton's forced, forced to flash on a fight in the early game Scion. I actually thought Luton, I actually thought Luton's was going to be uh, get a bit of an unfavorable. Uh, takedown as Chicken tries to get him from beyond with that reanimation passive. Well sneakily played coming out from Chicken. Like, I do have to admit, he's still trying to be very considerate, even though he's actually putting his team a little bit further behind, because that's three takedowns now. Like, we're seeing one kill and two assists from both jungle and top lane, and it's only going to make things worse, because Orn's already doubled in CS. Mid lane, look at K2. He is so low on health. I mean, Lance is getting low on mana, but oh. like I said in Champion Select, He's really looking to make sure he baits out that pool because he's very critical. Uh-oh. Emphis is nearby as well. The tower dive is very, very early. One hit, two hits. All sh** rope for the Vladimir. And part of the reason this is, is Lansing got a blue buff in that exchange in the top side of the map. And now a mana-hungry champion like the Rise with an early blue buff is a godsend for carrying Baha'i. Oh, just... The fact that you, like the fact that you said a godsend for carrying Baha, like Lanson playing as Rise, a mana proficient champion, taking all that blue buff is just gonna enable him to completely unload himself really early. I mean, he's already almost near double CS compared to K2. He's gonna get those items early. Like I didn't expect we're gonna see a tier of the goddess, maybe even complete straight into an Archangel staff up front. Uh, as well, maybe we might see a Rod of Ages as well. It really depends on what he might favor. I mean, he does have the advantage 
So he probably might look to capitalize and getting more damage and try and st um, stack that tier of the goddess really early so that he has that uh, active in his kit to try and soak up a little bit of extra damage, just like his passive does when he manages to uh, overcharge to two stacks instead of the common mistake of only managing to stack one and resetting when he uses that arcane discharge. Oh, it's going quite well for the Rise of the Mid Lane Lantern, now grabbing himself everything he fully complete his Archangel Staff, the Lost, the Lost Chapter, and the Tier of the Goddess. So he'll start stacking that one up quite happily. And this is not the early game that Balkan Hills are looking for. I mentioned how I feel like they kind of need to play an aggressive early game. They need to get themselves online. Top lane is not going in their favor. Jungle is kind of going in their favor, but Hecarim still needs a little bit of time. And mid lane, well, we've just talked about it in quite significance. This Rise is uh, having a very good time in the middle lane. And Bottom lane going even, but it's you do not want to be going even as Balkan, I don't feel. Meanwhile, there's an engagement oh. on the top side. Memsess is trying to do a repeat, but with a missing call of Forge God, I don't know if they have the actual damage. The CC landing, though, it will be enough. Meanwhile, the mid lane lands. is like, okay, I'm going to get out of here. But oh, no, they interrupted it. That was a beautiful interrupt. What a turncoat! Just Spy comes in, helps K2 survive the initial trade off against Lanson. And just turns the tide so harshly that he couldn't even defend himself. He tried so hard to get that execute before going down. But unfortunately, because he was right in turret range and he did take a turret hit, it really worked well in favor. And Vulcan have managed to make a slight turnaround. Like, that is their first two kills of the game. And it's nice to see that we're having some we're having some more action coming out from Vulcan. Because, like, to, to be honest, it is a little bit unfortunate that we're seeing Caring Bar taking a huge lead. Getting the first five kills right up front. Like, you know, we see Sion go down twice top. Hecarim and Vladimir going down really early mid and jungle. That I feel as though, like, Caring Bar do have the early game advantages. And they may lead this into a mid slash late game. Just mainly based on what you said earlier. How if they can get to 25 minutes when Jinx and Ryze come online quite harshly. Orn gets those completed items as well as upgrades a couple of others like the Infinity Edge. They could take this game away all the way through, but it's nice to see that Vulcan are now looking to try and make some changes. Like, they've managed to capitalize on some disadvantages, some weak point errors. As Lancet coming in on Hecarim. Well, Smite not exactly getting the, the damage he is looking for there, and this could potentially be a setup around the Mountain Dragon that is currently there for both teams, and it would be a bit of a shame if you didn't try and utilize his early advantage to grab them to the Mountain Dragon, but Lancet... Guys and stuff, a blue bar says, thank you very much. I want me I want me one of those. And there's potentially something happening on the bot side as Emphis seems to be hanging around. Yeah, the, we're seeing what we're seeing both jungles on opposite sides of the map. So we're seeing the mirroring effect wherever whenever one side is on the bottom, the other is at the top. Lanson, I am loving. Like he's really maximizing the use of that blue buff and going right on top of K2. Ludens is just wailing into chicken like no tomorrow. He doesn't care whether there's minions. You know, still around. He's going to go straight into Sion and try and chunk out his health as much as he can. Just as much as Lanson is really, like, wailing just as hard into K2. Like, he gets that snare. He's also just using his entire kit uh, in, in succession. And it's just working so well in his favor. Like, he's, he's trying to stay as far ahead as he can against K2, which is really nice. Oh, no. Luden. Lantern might be a little out of position, but the question is, is that full up? Looks like there is Jarvis a little bit out of position. They're diving on the lines. They both members in, but they do take out the Jarvan, the sacrifice to keep his ally alive. Super Mega Death Rock is simply not able to follow it up. And I liked what Karen Bar were trying to do, but the issue is that they just didn't respect the rotation towards the dragon. Oh, just up top. I'm not sure whether you saw that, but Luden tried to charge in and get the knockup since his pillar was behind. The call oh. of the forge. Oh, can he? He can't interrupt it, but he interrupts it with his body. One more hit and the clapping. Luden grabs himself a solo kill at the top side. Oh, that is such a staggering thunderclap. The flash as well as the finisher. Just this is really sending Luden online. Like he's getting close to finishing that stunfire game. Both players are trying to sort of mirror each other's strategies and try and burn that uh, Sunfire Cape immediately. Bottom lane, I'm loving, like, we've got a lot of action coming out, well, a lot of trading from both sides. It looks like it's working well, mainly in Varus's favor, because he does have that CS advantage. But what I do want to point out is that Displaced has gone for Guardian. And a majority of the time that Guardian has popped, it's mainly been because someone has actually been, you know, taken a summoner, sorry, an ability coming out from Cloud. 
and they do well to try and circuit up with a regeneratable shield, which is really favorable if you try to uh, stay in lane for a little bit longer. It will put them behind if they go for a trade, though. Well, they're not going for a trade just yet, and I think for the side of Karimba, they don't really want to be going for trades. I think they've got a fantastic late game bottom lane with the Tom Kane to protect the... Well, I wouldn't call... I, like, I don't like calling Jinx a immobile champion because of the way her passive is, but she technically is immobile, lacking a dash, and just going very, very fast with the fight start coming in her favor. But talking about the Jinx, there is something that I would like to call to attention on her, and specifically... Oh, we, never mind, we'll come back to that in a little bit, as Clown... Crowd, maybe there's no teleport isn't the birth and that is a beautiful tp to dissuade the pile on on the bottom side of the map for the chains of corruption now coming out there is a potential turnaround the time catch coming in to save the rise they are trying to get him out but they put him turnaround as the hecarim diving onto the back line lands in a little trouble mitch on the hill trying to tie out what he can but he's gonna get deleted out there and the scion is doing so much work displacing them case all right thank you very much grab me a kill on the time catch and a really good collapse by vulcan on the bottom side of the map that was just a huge turnaround. Just at 11 minutes 50, a majority of Kering Bar Guri down in the fight. A three for one trade in favor of uh, Balkan. So much to the point that I don't really know what Orm was thinking. Like he was just sitting there farming top lane while the rest of his team was playing in a 4v5 matchup down bottom in mainly to try and contest for a, a quick dragon rush. That when he decided to teleport down bottom lane, he was already behind enemy lines. And it was already too late. Like, he should have just saved that teleport for another occasion. If he wasn't going to use it up front, like we saw coming out from Chicken, he's better off just saving it for another attempt and just, like, you know, force his team to try and run away. Like, we did see Jarvan get out quite cleanly. But Rise, Jinx, and Tom Kench all go down with that single fight. And it was just highly unfavorable for them that it's just, like, they managed to capitalize on it so easily. Like, Vulcan got three kills and they went straight for Dragon Rush. And now they've managed to reset themselves in lane. I believe we're going to see a bit more action coming out from them. And since now they're actually caught up and they're flying, they're going to start getting ahead. Like, yes, they are a thousand gold behind, but that's nothing short of how well they're coming together as a team. It's a really good catch up being only a thousand gold behind. And you got to think in a way, it's a good signal that Balkan probably has some really good team play around the corner. The fact that they are individually getting a little bit uh, pressured in lane to generate a bit of a gold lead. And then... Pouring it back to 1,000 team play thinks really well to the potential future of team fights coming out of Vulcan, which is really exciting. But oh, Lanson using that early tempo he got with his blue buff. This lane for 2 K265 is really struggling for this Vladimir, even if he is 3 1 and 2. Yes, that is true. And to add on to that, add on top of that, he is behind in gold accumulation. He has the bounty on his plate, he has three kills. He is lacking one take one takedown assist, but that's nothing short of how well he's playing as a like when he's coming to a team. Like the early game, yes, he does have that disadvantage, but he's managed to make up. He's managed to make up for this lack mainly by going through team fights. And from what we've seen, he's really going to come well for his team. And I feel as though Balkan are going to try and take advantage of this, uh, you know, team fight capability that they're offering us on screen. Coming into like I guess roughly around the 18 to 22 mark. Meanwhile, MFI Ooh. making himself known a little bit prematurely. And now the potential turnaround, they are focusing onto the Tom Kench, however, now they've got Nexus, and there's no Tom Kench, but Emphis goes in, but he's just simply going to go in to die right there, and Tom Kench getting run down, but there was no protection for the Jinx, despite running the cleanse. It is not working out. You cannot be that far away from your hyper carry. Oh, and just as harshly, like, at the same time, we see K2 get caught up by Lancet and goes down to an easy trade. The Ignite pops, but that's not really going to help since Lancet's passive gave him the extra shield to try and soak up that unfortunate amount of true damage. Well played by Lancet and well played by K2, but I do have to specifically, specifically say well done to all of Vulcan for being able to try and take bottom lane. They're taking down their first heart. We're seeing first item completions happening across the board. Whereas in comparison, we're only really seeing Rise and Orn really coming online for their team at this point. I mean, Rise is quite ahead in CS. He does have that completed Archangel staff. Top lane, Orn's got that completed Sunfire Cape first. Now he's looking to try and go for the Abyssal Mask, which is really going to help him because it it'll help mainly Rise and Tom Kench unload a little bit better in team fights if Orn goes in first. And that's kind of what you want for the side of Karen Grau, Orn to be that man who's starting the fight with the Call of the Forge God and then the rest of the flop that is within his kit. So 
We'll see how that works out. They do grab themselves the Griff Child. So despite the struggles that they're having on the bottom side of the map, Karimba trying to say, okay, screw it. Let's go to the top side, see what we can get out of it. Grab themselves the major objective. And I think that is a really smart decision. They've got two winning lanes right now being top and mid. They need to focus a little bit more around them. And like, as I mentioned before in Champion Select, Java 4 should try and focus more towards top and mid because bottom lane, they picked away the champions before they went through the second phase of bans that they don't, they weren't sure what they were going to go up against. Like we saw Thresh in response to Tarm and Varus in response to Jinx that like they were really confident in their early game pressure that Java 4 should have actually focused more on Lantern and Ludens because from what we're seeing right here, right now, at 16.25, they are winning their lanes hardcore. The only thing that's not really working well in their favor is that Smite is just coming on so hard for his team. He's online sooner than we expected. He doesn't even have that completed Trinity Force, but he's making himself known around the map as if he has it already, you know, present in his infantry. Exactly. 3, 1, and 6 on this tech room, a 200 gold bounty. So he's definitely pulling his weight, but we'll see. Is he going to be around for the next fight? He is hanging around the top side, but everybody from Karangba is rotating up there right now. So they need to be a little bit careful. And they are now seeing a very aggressive Realm Warp going in. They're actually going tower diving under the tower. They are going onto Cloud. Can he stay alive and cut it out? The answer is yes, he can. They will take out the Jarvan. The tower dive is going horribly, horribly wrong. They pull in the Ornn as well as Jinx is like, hey guys, they need to be in part of this fight. They go turn around Lantern now, trying to do what he can, hunting down his prey. Smite's got to get the hell away and they lose only one member. But Karangba, that was a little more risky than I think they intended. It was a little bit more risky than they intended, but there is the comment saying the economic universe, higher risk can mean higher reward if they do manage to work well in their favor. And from what we saw, they did work it in their favor. They're claiming not one, but they're going for their second turret. They managed to take away at least two members. They almost managed to take down Smite, but unfortunately he managed to take away the Melbourne Cup with that dash away uh, to try and stay away from Lanson. I mean, it would have been heavily unfavorable, even more for Vulcan if Lanson caught him out, because Lanson is flying ahead. 3-2-4, 150 gold bounty, and his CS accumulation is near 10 per minute, which is quite impressive to see coming out from, you know, such an individual player in this early matchup. Like, he's done well against Vladimir in lane phase. Now he's doing well for the rest of his team coming into this mid, uh, this mid game. He's got two completed items. He's just absolutely unstoppable. And I love the fact that Lanson's first item outside of his mana item is, in fact, the Morellonomicon. It simply says, hey, Vladimir, uh, your entire champion is kind of based around the concept of, you know, healing. So let's put a little bit of a stop to this. So I love that as a first item because no one else on their team has the Grievous Wounds debuff. So we'll have to see how that works out. Is there maybe a skirmish around the dragon? Zion has access to that teleport, so I'm hoping to see it there. But Riftal being dropped in the mid as well. It's interesting, they're putting it down mid. <clears throat> I apologize, my throat got a little bit of a frog stuck in it. But, you know, look at this. They got, they've popped it down mid. Oh they've got a majority of the team, they've got a majority of Balkan's attention focused down there that they're able to take down Dragon uncontested. A little bit of a sneaky move, so you can ca uh, cannon try and get that death sentence in and steal it away. Oh, can he? But there we go. Change of Corruption coming out, and that feels very aggressive. Hecarim may get access to the backline. Jinx flashes out immediately, and now she's in the backline. Smite goes down. First victim of the fight. Can they battle line this proper? It doesn't look like it. it's called the Forge God. Was not able to have as much impact as I hoped for. No midget on a hill walking forwards as Chicken trying to hold the front line on this rise. But the issue is he's got no real backline to look after as they are just burning down the tank. Lanson, oh. tablet diving. He's going to pay for it. a little bit aggressive coming out of the rise. Lanson, what was that? You go straight on the turret, you take its attention, you get caught by the death sentence, and you pretty much signed your own death warrant with that single hookup. Oh, it's nice to see he went for chicken. I don't think this is... Oh, it actually is over. I actually thought there was going to be a little bit more as Mitchell on a hill tries to continue the trade right on top of K2, but doesn't finish it off. Like, I gotta say, we're seeing a lot of aggressive action coming out from, Car uh, from Caring Bar that... This could be early. This could be over pre-30 minutes. They are trying to play aggressive, and when you look at who has the kills and who has the damage, it makes a lot of sense. Lanson has two fully completed items. There is no one else on Summoner's Rift outside of his own top laner that actually has two items now. So I love that they're playing aggressive, and more importantly, I love that they're playing aggressive when Lanson is there. They understand the fact that, hey, Ryze is insanely strong right now. We need to work around that. But... The rest of the team is starting to get up. Jinx has enough 
to upgrade her second zeal item very shortly. So hopefully going into the Runan's Hurricane. And, you know, Jarvan now has picked up the Black Cleave as well. So a lot of damage is going to come out from Karingpa. And I'd love to see the aggression coming out. You know, speaking of that, Rise is online, yes. He is an incredible, he is a majority player for his team. What I definitely want to highlight, based on what I saw from that last team fight, is that he wasn't the only person that actually managed to completely unload what? a really strong what? kit. What? <laughs> this <Spot. hacker> him. <laughs> it was an interesting trade. He tries running around. He just tries laps around the blue buff, tries to get it, but is forced away. It's like, look at that. Caring bar are now collapsing. This is a 4-1 split. Uh, missing a skirmish on the bottom side. Lance, Crowd loses a lot of his health. Chicken's in a lot of trouble there, but he is going to get eventually taken down. The Jinx free hitting the... No! The land's in the team. The Cataclysm locking him in. Have a Nefs has grabs himself a kill there, trying to hunt himself down, but nothing more on that. But meanwhile, while that happened, on the bottom side of the map, Lanzan used three abilities and nearly killed Cloud. It was interesting. He had that stopwatch available, and now it's broken. But he managed to survive the upfront assault coming out from Cloud. Like, he gets the ulti on top. He tries to do an, a complete turnaround and get a complete advantage by whaling everything he has in his kit. But that stopwatch denied pretty much anything he had planned in store for him, which is really nice to see. So Lance is really coming line for his team, and it looks like we have a Baron Rush now. Potentially, but I think they need to be so safe. The Jarvan is so low on HP that I think this has to be a bait. There is Flash on Lantern, but he's not going to chase it down. No deciding to flash room prison that, but that is the teleport that was committed at a Lantern, so that's a decent committal of resources to no, well, real payout. I do, looking at the scoreboard, looking at the item accumulation between both sides, carrying by high on, he has got those, he has upgraded his two initial items, the Sunfire Cape and Abyssal Mask. Like I said before, historically, we see Orns try and complete, sorry, upgrade two of their own items before trying to share the, share around the wealth and give it to somebody else. If Jinx gets that upgraded Infinity Edge, like you mentioned earlier, this will work way too fairly for Karen Bar, and they could actually take this away. Like, they do have the team fight advantage. They are really striving for this Baron. They are thirsty for its blood. And I wonder what Belkin High are going to do in response, because at this point, they do have the death sentence available. Like, he's landing them pretty well now. It's just unfortunate that the rest of his team aren't really able to try and put them in a favorable position where they catch someone out and then just completely take it away with a 4v5, uh, you know, handicap. I mean, that is why we're seeing a lot of work around the vision right now, the famous vision wars. And right now, Vulcan need to get something, but instead, Karen Burst, they are a little bit maybe impatient, starting up the Baron almost immediately. 7,000 HP, but the, the Hecarim trying to get in, but they need to CC him hard. He is going in for the fight. The Chains of Corruption lining up members. The Hecarim ultimately getting multiple members. The Jinx trying to do what she can on the backline, using that stopwatch to save herself alive. Baron is getting involved in this fight, but Crown is saved in the Cataclysm, ironically, and now they're going to get wiped out. Karing Bar, a little bit aggressive with that Baron start, did not work it out, and may potentially even hand Baron over to Vulcan. And just like that, my prediction was correct. They managed to catch out one person, no, actually not just one person, but two members from Caring Bar. They tried so no one focused Cloud. The only person that focused Cloud was MFI, and he couldn't really do a lot for his team. He's got those two completed items, the Blade of the Ruined King, the Gwinsu's Rage Blade. He's also got those Ninja Tabbies, which is a nice defensive uh, response to what they've got in their lineup that it's really saved him in a pinch. And from what we saw, he really came in line for his team. He managed to take down Jarman 4. He managed to help his team clean up in succession. Hecarim did so well with that CC cleanup, just the ulti, the charge. It was really unfortunate that Lantern went down first in that team fight. And considering how strong he is for his team, him going down first really put Karen Bar behind. And they had to not only give up Baron buff, but at least four kills for the uh, for Karen Bar. And that's really going to set them behind because look at the gold accumulation. It is still tight, Nick. It is literally down to the wire between these two teams. The only thing they really have in their pocket is that they have six turrets, whereas Vulcans still only have one. They're not applying enough pressure on the map. Having this blue buff, they should start looking to pressure lanes, push them out, get some turrets, because if they don't, this is going to be very unfavorable. And I think Karen Fire might actually take this away just because they are getting the major focus of Summoner's Rift. I mean, Karen Bar, they need to play a little bit defensive now, although Lanson uh, feeling very confident in himself to push against a Baron buff, but Vulcan need to use this Baron buff to crack open the turrets on the map. It's called Standing Gold for a reason, and they need to grab themselves, equalize the turret score to some degree, because 
Once they do that, Reinhardt, they'll actually be able to start equalizing the goal difference and potentially even getting a lead, but they seem afraid to step up. They do. I mean, Yautos, look where Red Lantern is. He's behind enemy lines. They know where he is. The Firelap chase coming out from the ice fights. Oh, oh they're still looking for Jensen turning around there. They're diving onto the back line, though, but Jinx is left untouched. Jensen, though, in the back line, doing and very short. The Vladimir deleting the Jinx into the backline. Now it's the tail of the carries. Who can carry this one? Alansen may be the only man standing out of carrying, but a very disjointed fight. The plan was to get Rise at the backline, but they couldn't actually do anything. Vladimir is like, all right, hey, Jinx, so you're not allowed to play League of Legends anymore. Destroys the Jinx. And the Varus, while he did get focused down a little bit, was able to stay out alive. Ludens should be able to get out of this, but this is so much turret being taken down. There's so much pressure being applied by Balkan. Like, we, this was absent before, but from that last team fight, they managed to spike up the courage to actually continue pushing. They have Baron buff. Oh no, they caught this Lanson. Not looking good. Lanson needs to get out of this alive. With Lanson dead, this is potentially a disaster. The saving grace is that everyone else has finally come back up from the previous fight. So, hopefully, we will see Balkan Hills High School backing away, doing a little bit of a reset and then continuing the cleanup. They have a top, they have two top lane turrets and one bottom lane turret to grab before they can really break open the base of Karing Bahai. Just looking at how Karing Bahai have now been forced in an unfavorable position. They are now on the opposite side of the spectrum. They have to sit within their baseline. They have to protect their front lines. We need to see more effective wards on their side of the map rather than the enemy territory because they have now got map pressure on their side. Like they have their mid, they have the mid lane inhibitor down. They have, they still have a few turrets available left online, but just because of how much uh, Vulcan High have managed to come online in this like 27 minutes, is just completely staggering. Like they, they've pretty much turned this game around. Vladimir has come online. He's got a three item power spike. That Proto Bow is so efficient for the upfront engage you've got the rabidon's death cap for raw ability power damage the zonia's hour class that is both aggressive and defensive and very effective that i have to add uh if he gets caught out in a bit of a pickle uh that's just really working well for his team and what's even more interesting like based on that last team fight if orn doesn't get that call of the forge up front ray he knocks it back into the team it's really going to force an unfavorable position and it's really going to turn the tides well in favor of balkan mainly because in that last team fight he was actually denied. He was stunned before he could actually, you know, hit the ram back in the opposite direction. And just Jinx went down so harsh in that fight because K2, as we saw, went straight on top of him, wailed right into his face, got the ulti, got the entire kit into him, the Proto Bolt, and the complete execution. That really worked well and set this, you know, going to set the game in favor of Bulk, of uh, Balkan High. And for the carrying bot lane, Midget on a Hill is running the cleanse instead of the heal, which means that Tom Kench should never be more than a step away. The Jinx needs protection. I mentioned before how I'd love to see, you know, Jinx being paired up with a Tom Kench to make sure she stays safe. The issue with that pairing is, well, you can't stay safe if you're not near each other. So that is going to be a focus for these teams. But right now we are seeing another focus of Vulcan. They said, okay, we're going to grab the standing gold on the top side of the map now. So... They are now, while they may not have Baron buff, they still are in such a tempoed position to start taking every objective off the map. Well, you know, speaking of that, look where Cyanid. He's pushing bottom lane to get that upfront pressure. We see them putting a lot of pressure top lane. Mid lane, you don't even need to worry about. They have super minions already active in their list, in their roster, that they only really need to focus on mid lane if they manage to claim the next Baron and completely ace all of Carrying Bar. Oh, they're going to force a fight. Call the Forge got less more moments. They've caught the Varus out of position. This is going to be... They can look down. They do. And now... The teleport may be a little bit too late. We'll have to find out as they are diving onto the back line. It looks like they may have actually got this Lantern forcing it back. The Jinx is in so much trouble trying to do a damage that she can. And in fact, I think Carrying Bar will be able to hold on to the fight for now. A beautiful engage coming out of Luton sets the team up for a potential comeback. I, I am absolutely ecstatic. That was just a huge turn code. They managed to ace all of Belkin, and this is going to work well for them because they're going to be able to respond, or should I say capitalize, on such an investment in that team fight that they're now going to try and look to push mid lane backwards a little bit, get it past that midpoint, get it right on top of their turret, deny as many super minions as possible. And we're also going to see Baron has actually spawned, so this is a very timely, favorable response. They've managed to like use their internal clock so effectively that this is going to be an uncontested Baron. And definitely another thing I have to highlight is that Orn still is sitting at a perfect KDA. He has not died yet for his team. 
he is really working well for Caring Bar that I feel as though if they try to do this one more time, this could be it as we see Railward coming straight to bed. They're going to try and continue this lead and go straight for another objective. The macro gameplay is coming out from both teams is absolutely amazing. And this is better than what we saw Caring Bar high in the previous game. Last time we saw this team, they got ahead of the game and then they faulted in the mid lane and didn't really know mid game and didn't really win after that. Now it feels a lot stronger. While yes, they are making a few errors at left and right, that's human. And I love to see the macro decisions coming out of Karimba. So now, with that Baron buff, where are they going to go? I think it is critical with this buff though, Reinhardt. They need to break open one of the inhibitors. You know what, Eosos? You're not wrong. You're completely right. They need a reset mid lane. They have those super minions still active on the roster. They need to try and deny as many as possible. Force it right into baseline. No turrets are left outside of Balkan High's base. They might be able to do a 4-1 split if they're careful. The only unfortunate thing that they do have to worry about is that if one member gets caught out, it'll spell disaster for carrying bar. And that could almost mean the game ending moment. Well, I think I think that it pretty much comes down to one team fight. Whoever wins will take the game. Whoever loses, well, will do just that. As we are seeing a full stack in the middle lane. Ludens has that call of the Forge God available. And I think that's going to be utterly important when it comes to starting this fight. But right now, letting the Baron minions do their thing. A 2-2-K, two, 2-6-5, two, two, taking a lot of damage from this Rise and Jinx combination right now. Jinx sitting at 75% uh, crit chance. So doing a lot of damage when she's able to fire those rockets off. Yeah, that is right. She has that 25% crit chance. What the heck, Cannon? That was, that was so much damage from Lanson. Just what the dingoes? That was insane. And that could potentially be openings now. Because right now, all he does is throw damage into the sound. They've now broken open the inhibitor line. And this is going to be the option. Carrying bar. While they won't be able to end the game on this, they're going bottom lane. In fact, they will try and break open the base. So hopefully, we are getting sync up now as the turret is taken down. The inhibitor is the next thing live. And I think Vulcan need to do something, or they're going to keep losing their base. They do. They definitely do. At 32 minutes 30, they, Caring Bar have now got two inhibitors down. Their inhibitor have respawned. They don't need to worry about a single thing besides the fact that Vulcan High may be able to take this, may be able to take this game back if they catch out an enemy player. Well, that's kind of their hope so far. And the issue is that I don't think Balkan's going to have the option to catch out someone. Now, look where the side of Caring Bar are going. They said, hey, uh, you, don't have an you don't have an inhibitor in mid. You don't have an inhibitor in bottom lane. That means we have no need to go to any of those two lanes. Now we're simply going to uh, run it down top. So this is going to be a really good thing. Caring Bar, Balkan, they need to do something. The issue is that when we come to these 5v5 team fights, while Balkan have done very, very well in them, it's usually when carrying part of the ones engaging, which is now not going to be the case. A nice little display, a nice little display of comedy coming out from Displeased and Ludens. Just give us a bit of a show party. I like that they still have a bit of humor, you know, left in their sockets after such a huge, horrendous turnaround. Like, look, they're really, they're tripping away at the rest oh, of the game. Oh, oh Lance is now trouble. He's going to get deleted for the fight. Even starts so, so to buy a little bit of time, but can they keep him alive? The answer is actually looks like he's getting into the back line. Jinx though, free hitting on the backside through all this. K26 to try to do what he can. Cloud now joining the fight, but the Scion is the first one to die. And now, about a tank line, this could potentially be disastrous. Lanson going a little bit far forward, grabbing himself a double kill. K2 is trying to find of the orb, but gets clapped on. And Cloud, the Death Rocket does just that, taking your MTS. Like, all right, guys, um, entertain the jungle for longer. Get a little bit of help. The Orn's like, don't worry, buddy, I got you. The clap comes out. A double kill. And that's actually going to be the end. Karen Bar with one team fight that started off disastrously. Take the game. Vulcan, you did damn well, but unfortunately not able to make it. Congratulations, Karen Bar High. You know what? They did have the early... They had Karen Bar had the early game advantage. Just the amount of team fights happening. The amount of synergy. The connection that we saw. The link-ups between top, middle, and jungle predominantly. And then bottom lane for a little bit. The mid game, we saw Bell can actually make a turnaround. They managed to catch up members from Caring Bar, turn it into a 4v5, and it is absolutely like they were just doing so well. It was just heavily unfortunate that when it came towards the, the late game transition, they got caught out, they got aced. All of Caring Bar managed to take down that, I believe it was the second Baron buff, completely keep going, use Realm Warp, go straight for Dragon, take down two inhibitors at 32 minutes and then completely just chip away at the last remaining possible objective that really set the game apart. And like from what we just saw, 
They managed to ace away the rest of bulk and high, take down inhibitor, take down the rest of the base. And like, you know, they managed to claim a victory for their team. Exactly. And Karimba, you have to look at this man in the middle lane. Lanson did so much, grabbed an early blue buff for himself, and then took control of the game. Like, if we're looking at the damage charts right now, 36,000. He did 10,000 more damage than the second highest damage dealer in the game, which was his team's own Jinx. So, an amazing job by the mid lane of Karimba High to get an early lead and then be able to be a focus point for his team to get control. And while they did falter a little bit in the mid game, we can't lie to ourselves, they did eventually take it after what should have been a team fight wipe when Lansing got caught out of position. But the Zonyas to buy time. Displeased Grunt came in with the Tom Kench, babysat his mid lane, says, don't worry, buddy, I got you. Gobbled them up, threw him into his own back line, and then they were able to take the fight from there. And with that, that is pretty much the game number one under wraps for this first segment of the High School E-League Tuesday. That's just to give everybody a bit of a reminder. We do have a second game coming around the corner at 7 o'clock Sydney time. So please don't be afraid to go away, get some refreshments, do some extra. We'll see you at 7 o'clock for the next segment. What does perfect even mean? Is there even such a thing? Oh, ooh. Can we switch up all the rules? And imagine a utopia. A darling, I'm just so fed up with these expectations. They can weigh me down. My heart is begging me to get the hell out of my lane. I wanna live inside the upside down. For a minute and pretend. Honey, I'm a perfect ten. Whoa, whoa. Honey, I'm a perfect 10, whoa, whoa, and if I say it enough, it gets ingrained in my head, and I start to see, honey, I'm a perfect 10. Say it. 